Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Mike and Wendy, and we're going to be talking all about investing in multifamily properties in the U.S. So cross-border investing. I'm so excited that they're here to share their knowledge with us. Before we get into it with Mike and Wendy, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Mike, Wendy, so great to have you guys back. Return guests. Well, you must have done something right the first time. Either that or I'm hard up for guests, but it's not. <laughs> Just kidding. Love you guys. Um, why don't we give me a bit of an intro uh, on who you guys are and what you do as real estate investors. Sure. Uh, well, we've been, uh, we've been investors for... I think almost as long as you, we, I don't know, tw 20 something now, but uh, we're also renovators. We're, we're, we're children of contractors. So my, my stepdad, his dad were general contractors and carpenters. And so it rubbed off and we, um, so we got into real estate fairly young and then, you know, been renovating our own places ever since. Um, what else do we need to share? Um, we, we started off doing a lot of work on single family homes, moving into duplexes, triplexes, and our latest uh, adventure has been a 14 unit building in, in uh, the US. So I think that's nice. what we'll be chatting about a little today. Yeah, let's let's dive right in. Um, let's talk about you know the U.S. market. I think a lot of Canadians are interested in investing in the U.S. and a lot of Canadians are investing are interested in investing in multifamily in the U.S. I know there's just a lot more stock in the U.S. in terms of just a lot more apartment buildings, a lot more population. Um, so just I guess first and foremost, you know why multifamily. I know you guys do also have some single family stuff in the U S but what attracted you to multifamily and, and across the border uh, in the U S specifically? Well, there's, there's actually kind of two, two uh, components to that in the States. You'll see a lot of single family home portfolios for sale. So mm -hmm. that's one version of their multifamily mm -hmm. um, uh, option where you can buy right now. We, we were presented with a 155, single family home portfolio to purchase. So it's a little, wow. a little aggressive, yeah. but, uh, but we, we, we wanted something under one roof, um, yeah. a little easier to manage. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it, uh, the property we ended up purchasing, um, picked all the boxes for it. It, it wasn't a, a massive investment. Um, we were able to do some creative financing and uh and the returns are great so that uh it took off when he, yeah when the he trifecta financing he's talking about a vtv so okay uh, yeah and that's kind of key when you're investing in the u.s because they seem to be for some reason a lot more open down there to creative ways to do financing up here for some reason we are a little more conservative and don't use as many techniques as they use down there one of them is um, a, a lot of them are seller financed, and um, they also, you know, and so where you, depending on where you're purchasing, some things are priced so low you can pay cash for them, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you're still buying houses for fifty grand, a hundred grand down there, and you're like, boom, that was easy. Don't have to bug the bank for that one. So. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So where did yeah. you guys, uh, where did you guys end up investing in the multifamily and why did you choose that market? Uh, we invested in Indianapolis, Indiana. And, uh, and when we tell people that they go, what, what, well, huh? Like what, you know, they're thinking something cool, like new Orleans or LA or whatever. No, uh, no Indianapolis. And you know, um, here's why our God kids and his best friend, are from Indianapolis and we were there visiting a lot and we started getting used to you know getting easily you know how to easily get around we were familiar with neighborhoods we you know just started knowing our way around town and also started paying attention to real estate prices down there and going wow there's some major major amazing opportunities here so so that's why so we, there was familiarity with the market. And I think a lot of people, when they say, you know, 
how do you choose what city to invest in in the US if you're not from there? And I feel like there has to be some sort of a connection to that city. Like you either have family there or friends there, or you've visited there a lot. You know that city. Um, maybe in Mike's case, his head office is based in Georgia. Uh, so, you know, that's another place that we're looking to invest in because, you know, he's been there numerous times for work events and is starting to get familiar with that market. We now have agents down there looking uh, for properties for us and that kind of thing. So I feel like if there's a connect, you have a connection to it, either emotionally or geographically or whatever it is somewhere, you know, family wise, uh, that's a good place to start. I, I was going to mention a, another thing that you want to consider when choosing your market is don't invest in the U.S. specifically unless you're going to get a better return than if you get what you would get in Canada. Yeah. It's harder to do, um, so it better it's be worth do, it. It's harder to do down there, you mean? Down there, okay. yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, mm. so it's it's harder for Canadians to do in the U.S. Um, for larger projects, for sure. Um, so you want to make sure that it's worth your your time and effort. So. I, I, and why is that? Why is it more difficult to invest? I'm guessing with banking sector and some of the other challenges. I mean, COVID aside, the fact that, you know, it's a nightmare to travel right now, but yeah. talk about, you know, what about some of the other elements that are, you know, more challenging as Canadians investing in the US? Uh, I would say the, the two big ones for me are the financing. If, if you need financing, that can be a big challenge and also managing the property from a different country. So our experience with single family homes, um, the homes that we, we own were not hmm, in the best neighborhoods, I, I guess is the best way to put it. And so you get the, the matching property management to those homes. Um, so we had some pretty rough property managers and so that was a, another reason actually why we got out of the single family homes and into the multifamily mm -hmm. because we could scale up on our on our property management. So um, so that was a huge thing um, to us was the property management. And so we, we Wendy can speak to how. Yeah, if you ha you need to do your due diligence with property managers, you know, the first couple of properties we bought we blindly took the property management company that was already doing the property. We're like, oh, easy peasy. We'll just, yes, we'll just take that person. They know the history of the uh, the building. They already knew the tenants that were in there. We were like, this is great. Dumb move. Uh, so we now, uh, Mike very diligently, and this is the thing uh, in terms of doing your due diligence, he researched, we narrowed it down, we found 18 property management companies in Indianapolis, did it, he did the full spreadsheet, we did the thing, we did, you know, what kind of, and then we narrowed it down again to six, and then we flew down to Indianapolis, and we spent two days interviewing a property manager, property management companies, <laughs> and they, I'm sure, we, we put them through the ringer, they must have thought we were crazy town because we they, these were two hour interviews. So if you're going to do this, I'm, prepare yourself and you know schedule them in two hour blocks when you're scheduling this for your day. And we had a battery of questions that we uh, fired at them, but you know we got all of our questions answered and we were very confident leaving. But you know take the time if you can not now maybe, but when we're allowed to fly into the States again, take the time to do that and interview a good handful of them. And you'll know immediately who you connect with. You'll know, you know, just based on how they're, you're greeted when you walk in the building, even, you know, oh, please come, you know, we were immediately. Or what their building <laughs> looks like. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. there was some of that too. Um, so yeah, you're just, you know, when you feel like you're taken care of and the building's clean and these are nice people and they're answering all your questions. And then they say, and if you add more to your portfolio, we'll continue to lower your monthly fee that we charge. You're like, yeah. So I think we started yes. at, with this property management company, we started at 9% uh, 
I think at the beginning of the conversation, by the end percent, we were down to 7% <laughs> charging. Uh, and then if we add more to the portfolio, it's just going to keep going down from there. So And, and we negotiated uh, the new leases. We, we negotiated that down for how much they get. Uh, they wanted a one month's rent. We negotiated that down. We negotiated yeah. the late fees, everything we negotiated down. Yeah. So. So all of that is negotiable. So don't think nice. that you know, this is hard and hard and fast rules yeah. here. Yeah. So uh, Mike, you mentioned financing as well is a bit of a challenge. And Wendy, you mentioned the VTB. Yeah. So at what point did you hit that sort of financial wall or was it a situation where you went straight for a vendor take back? So for those people that are not familiar with vendor take back, maybe explain that a little bit. Or was it a situation where you had trouble with financing and therefore you started negotiating with the seller on a vendor take back? Well, I think uh, where we where we knew it was going to be an issue was when we owned uh, single family homes, we, we actually wanted to bundle them and finance them. Uh, and we we uh, encountered some some issues of US banks lending to Canadians. So we knew that it was going to be a bit of a bit of a challenge, um, which is fine. So we uh, our agent presented us with this off-market deal and um we're like look the the numbers are great we don't know if we can if we can do a quick close um so we said hey if the seller is willing to do the financing on this we can do a quick close we can give them what they want a whole bit so um so we we actually negotiated the vtb like that was our first offer we actually uh we asked for 90% VTB. So uh, uh, they came back with 80 and we're like, sure, sounds great. So, so, <laughs> so we, uh, so what they've done is um, on this building, they're financing 80% of it for two years. We pay interest only. Um, and within the two years, we can secure um, more conventional financing. Uh, it, may not through be through one of the you know bank of america or or even a canadian bank in the us um you know people think oh i've got my royal bank uh bank account in canada i can get a us mortgage not like that it's uh it's from what we've experienced anyways it's yeah. uh you're starting from scratch essentially it's difficult for canadians to get financing down there we have found um there's no tradition like you, you'd think right that it would be easier because there's like a gazillion banks in the u.s versus in canada we have the big six and you know and other in you know the smaller credit unions and unions etc they've got gazillion banks and credit unions and all sorts of different lenders but uh yeah they're just not jumping on board to like lend to us there are some that do though and it's very interesting because anyone that we found that will lend to canadians has very specific rules about how that will roll out one of them for example um that we found in uh based in boston will lend uh to a canadian but their stipulation was you had to be in the multifamily market in the US for a, a period of two years before they'd even look at you to lend. So they just want some history there. So that was one, mm -hmm. one that we found. There was another one in California. You had more. Uh, yeah, they, they'll, they stipulate that for each unit, it needs to rent for at least 600 a month. Each unit also needs to be valued at at least $50,000. So it, it's, it runs the spectrum it, and it can just be random things too. Uh, about what uh, but now that we know the rules from some of these lenders we can start looking at buildings and going oh well we, this one meets their requirements we can approach them for financing because of these rules but they're they're not easy to find they are certainly um you know it is about doing your uh, your homework and uh it, asking around and even if you're you know your agents your realtors in the states they might have a line on something it, and it's not just the banks being jerks. The reason that they do this is because the loans are non-recourse. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing. We don't really have that here. So, so Mike, Mike, explain that because most people won't understand what a non-recourse loan is. Um, 
up here, if you default or, or you get your home taken away, it'll affect your credit rating. It'll, you'll lose your home, all of these things. Whereas if with a for non- a For seven, at least seven years. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. with a, a non-recourse, it's just kind of how it sounds. It's right. they, they don't have the tools that they do up here. Um, one is just the, the structure of the loan, but also because we're Canadians, they can't really Come get affect you <laughs> in a different country. Right. So, so yeah, and the way that I understand it is that, you know, in, in Canada, we often put up personal guarantees, right? So if let's call a situation where I go out and buy a building and I'm guaranteeing that loan, and then, you know, I default on the loan while well, the bank is going to take the property and they're also going to come after everything else that I own. Right. Whereas in the US market, I think from what I understand, it is like the bank will secure the property. You go default on the property. They're going to take your property back, but yeah. they're not going to come after all of your personal and, assets as well. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which yeah. is what happened in the crash of 09, 08, yeah. 09, you know, yeah. like people just walked away from their houses and yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. So in the, are you working with a, a broker then like looking at all these different financial institutions or were you just going and kind of uh, vetting them individually? Actually a bit of both. Um, we were, we were looking at a couple of different uh, options and then uh, we on also our on our own. Yeah. And then we are also uh, in, in discussions with a broker and a broker will charge you the, the, They'll try to charge you up front to find you a lender, and um, and then they will also charge you points um, if they can secure financing for you. So, so you mentioned the uh, agent, and we kind of skipped over that. So, how did you find this property? Oh boy, we I think we have four agents working <laughs> for us in Indianapolis. So we have somebody single family homes, somebody doing. Uh, duplexes or they call them doubles down there and uh somebody doing off market and then somebody doing commercial so um so our commercial guy actually brought us the off market deal so um, and by commercial you mean commercial residential more than six units yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Nice. so he's uh he's kind of our go-to agent he uh he he find he works really really hard for us so yeah uh, he's brought us some really interesting it's, stuff. It's been shocking actually to see how much off market stuff he digged up. I'm like, who do you know? That looks amazing. <laughs> but he's also, he's been uh, a realtor down there for over 25 years. Yeah. Nice. So he is really familiar with mm -hmm. the market. So what was the plan with this property going in? Was this a, um, was this a value add piece? Um, was this like, or was it just a straight turnkey property? Uh, not turnkey. It had been recently renovated. 13 of the units had been renovated, renovated yeah. leaving one unit basically as an empty shell. Yeah, they and had they had started the renovation um, on the 14th unit and uh, and they didn't finish it before they listed it. So um, so they were like, here, you do one. So we were like, sure, let's do a reno. So yeah, it was only one that we had to renovate, which was great. So. And the roof is is quite new. Everything's either new or has been uh, recently serviced, like the boiler and mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah, so. so pretty darn turnkey. It was pretty <clears throat> awesome. And what was the the um, building class like? We have A A B C and D. What would you classify the building as? It's a B. It's oh, a, that's it's good. Old, yeah. yeah, it's an older building, but it's in a great neighborhood, and the buildings in great shape and modernized so and, yeah. did, and did you have b quality tenants in there too or were you kind of like having to replace some people with speaking to that we're actually uh our our property manager is turning over uh some of the tenants because uh they're being undercharged and mm -hmm. so um they've been able to not only increase rents but uh adding an uh, a utility uh, monthly utility a, fee a monthly utility yeah. fee so between that on average uh it's increased the rental income by about 15 percent so and is this a is 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 indianapolis a city that is uh relatively landlord friendly 
Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> you can, you can start eviction process, uh, the process five days after the first of the month, if they have not paid the rent. So, wow. yeah. and you can, there's you a can, couple of ways to do it too. So you, you know, you can kind of go eviction light first. So you kind of give them the Notice, please, please notice get out. Yeah. yeah. And then if they don't, then you have to go into the, you know, the tribunal or whatever, but, uh, and that, you know, starts costing a little money because you have to file documents and all that, but, but, but it will get them to pay. We we've, we've had, uh, where people have left and this, the, the repairs needing doing to the property, um, amounted to more than what the security deposit was. So, uh, our manager has had no issues getting the extra funds from from the tenants because yeah. it affects their credit rating and their ability to secure another another property. Mm. So can we can we talk numbers a little bit? Like what did what were you guys buying this for cost per unit? Let's start there or overall cost. Uh, we bought it for six hundred and fifty thousand for fourteen units. <laughs> and <laughs> um, so. 46,000 a unit. What was the average rent bring, being brought in on, on each unit? At, at the time it was 550 a unit. Yeah, we're now oh, so, at six. We're, so we're at 595 plus, uh, plus the $25 utility fee. What's the, what was the term on the VTB? You said it was two years interest only, but what was the interest rate you were able to get on? We did, we did 8% interest only. Which, which is, I would say on the higher side, would you agree on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, we can probably, well, now VTBs are a little, little harder to get. Uh, my, uh, market's tightening. The cap rates are dropping. So we just wanted to secure it. Um, it's not going to be a long-term thing. So, and because it was interest only, we didn't really care. Like one percent right. or whatever on that small of amount. We we didn't. Yeah. Really, we just wanted to secure the building, and then flip it to uh, to. The conventional financing and so what's the plan after the two years is up with the vtb you're going to take it to a conventional lender like once it's stabilized a little bit more or you guys have a more of a track record in the u.s market that's the plan and um we we want it to season a little bit so we bought it at 650 and if we were to to um to refinance right away that's basically what they're going, what the bank will refinance based on yeah. or finance based on. So we want it, we want to increase the rents. Um, when we bought the place, there was an appraisal done with an ARV of 840,000. So everything's been done. So, uh, and since then the market has increased. So we want it, we want, when we do a, do the financing, we want to get the top dollar return funds to our, to our uh, financial partner on this deal. And, uh, and there should be a, some left over to split the proceeds. Nice. Sounds like a pretty winning transaction uh, all the way around. Are you guys uh, looking to do more of the same in, in uh, Indianapolis? We are, we are. Yeah, that's why they, now our, our off-market agent keeps sending us <laughs> like, here's a 17 house package, here's a 60 house package. So. <laughs> You know, it's been it's been interesting because it's you know it's a lot of uh, time and effort and work that goes into sort of you know looking to see where these places are located and you know sort of if we can find a little bit more history on them and um, you know all the due diligence that goes into each of these places and and then also coming back to the seller to see you know can we split up this package you know a lot of them very much very often will allow you to sort of cherry pick which properties in their portfolio that you want and sometimes they don't so I think that's a, a good question because some are far more lucrative and you know and uh, in, in a better place than uh, than others so and just because they're lucrative doesn't mean it's a better property yeah. what's your uh, what's your best piece of advice guys for people that want to invest uh, Canadians that want to invest in the US market especially in the multifamily space you know, make sure that you're choosing a property that matches your goals, right? Because, you know, certainly there are some markets where the cash flows amazingly, but the passive appreciation isn't there, you know? So it just depends on, on what you're look, looking at. Is this a long-term game for you? Then maybe that doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Because it, obviously it'll, 
go up anyways, not crazy bananas like the Canadian market does at the time. But um, so, you know, that's, that's probably my, my piece of advice, I would say is, you know, what it does it match your goals and, and, oh, and you had, what's that awesome website that you go to, to look for the A, B. Oh, CBRE yeah. has a great, great uh, uh, resource for determining the cap rates or where you're, where you're looking to invest. So that, that's really useful. I guess my, my biggest piece of advice would be do your due diligence and don't believe the pro forma that you're given. Oh yeah, don't do <laughs> ever. it. Don't, ever, <laughs> go by the past numbers and use that to do your calculations with and um, that's, you know. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Uh, really insightful for those people that are interested in investing in the US market in the multifamily space. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the session with Mike, Wendy, go ahead, hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel and feel free to leave comments and questions below for both Mike, Wendy, and myself. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With it, I'll say, guys, thanks for coming back and being guests and sharing your knowledge of the US market with, with my audience. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey. And I look forward to hopefully at some point connecting with you guys soon. We live around the corner from each other and we still can't oh, see each other. See the wine on your wall, it's waiting for us. Uh, those bottles are <laughs> half empty. So, but uh, when they're, I'll fill them up when you guys are coming over. Awesome. <laughs> awesome guys. Nice to see you and uh, take care. We'll talk soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye.